All right, hey, I'm not going to be back for a couple more days, but got some more videos coming to help you guys out, get you guys ready for big quiz number three. And like I said, hey, I'm doing well, so man, you guys can email me, send me a text, whatever. You got some questions because uh, we got to make sure that big quiz three, bam, we knock it out of here. So um, the last thing that we really need to cover because you guys have looked at GDP, you looked at the price indices. So with GDP, you look real and nominal. You looked at the price indices, GDP deflator, CPI. Uh, even talked a little bit about the producer price index. In fact, just really kind of to make a quick note, we could have an index. Remember, the consumer price index is based on what the average consumer consumes. Hey, as far as you are an average, you're experiencing inflation different. Like I said before, I, I don't eat bananas. So when the price of bananas goes up, that's not in my basket. So other people might be experiencing inflation. So one thing I like to think about is that... It, Everyone experiences inflation in their own unique way because none of us are the average consumer. It depends on what we have. In fact, we could have the Brent Thomas price index or the Kyle Gantz price index, the Mimi Williams price index. Okay, it could be based on them. Um, so there's going to be different measures of inflation and everybody's going to have unique experience of that. And that's why there is no single way to calculate the price level. But the two main ones are CPI and the GDP deflator. And like Mr. Kozon pointed out to you, the producer price index, which is a basket of what the average producers are buying in terms of energy, in terms of labor, in terms of those things that they use to produce goods. So when we see an increase in the producer price index, that usually is a leading indicator that we're going to see some increases in the CPI down the road because those input prices have gone up. So anyway, I don't want to get into that too much. I think you guys have got that, how to calculate those in very important statistics as well as the unemployment rate. I want to just emphasize what uh, you guys have talked about is that inverse relationship between GDP and unemployment because if we have unemployment, we're not producing as much. And when we, get, when we start employing people, production goes up. So we get that inverse relationship between GDP and unemployment. Now... Back when we were covering economic growth, we talked about a particular model. And at the time, we just introduced it. We said later we're going to come back to that. Because one of the things we're going to examine more in the third quarter is economic fluctuations. The fluctuations in the economy, like today's current recessionary gap, we're operating below our economy's capacity. And so we want to be able to understand that and have a model for that. And that model you guys already know. In fact, let's see if you guys remember it. Okay, there it is. The... Longer and aggregate supply curve, remember that? And we had their real GDP and the price level. So real GDP there on the, on the, uh, I'm sorry, the x-axis and price level on the y-axis. And then we had that vertical long run aggregate supply curve. Remember that vertical long run aggregate supply curve, we said LRAS, long run aggregate supply. That was potential output, Y bar. Our potential GDP, that's how much our economy, how much the resources in our economy, the resource and technology, that's how much we could produce at a sustainable level. Now, what I want to do is add on to this something else. And this is going to, we're going to get into more depth and some of the reasoning behind it. But this is kind of laying the foundation and giving you guys a context of these different things, these different statistics that we've learned about uh, how to measure and how we can put them into a model. In fact, what have you calculated here? You guys have learned how to calculate real GDP and price level. What's the price level? That's the price, that's measured by the price index. So that could be measured by CPI or it could be measured by GDP deflator. But that's a model we want to just, now that we have some context, we want to add some more too. We want to understand, I called the worksheet that you have graphing gaps. Now, if our economy is operating at capacity, there's no gap. Sometimes, though, we're operating below capacity or above capacity. Now, I know that sounds confusing because isn't capacity a physical limitation? But what we're talking about is that we may be able to go for a short period of time above our capacity. As students, you guys have done this before. Sometimes you'll stay up late. You'll cram a little bit extra. But you can't sustain that on a long-run basis. You can't stay up night after night after night. You're going to burn out. Similarly with our economy, we could be in a situation where we have workers working overtime, where we have people and resources working beyond what is their sustainable capacity. So we could have a gap where we're producing more than our potential GDP, 
or less than potential GDP. So let's just take a look at these gaps. What do we need to add to this? If you recall, I called this model aggregate demand and aggregate supply. We've got a long run aggregate supply on there. That's the long run, though. That's our potential. In the short run, how much we actually produce does depend on the price level. So we have an upward sloping, and I'm going to draw it with some curvature. I want you guys to do that. And we'll learn more about why we do that. So we're going to draw that short run aggregate supply right there. Okay, and so it's going to be here. It's going to be upward sloping, and we draw it with some curvature there. And that is to say that when the price level goes up, producers tend to produce more. Now, we'll get into the details behind that, but for right now, that's what we want to draw in there. Okay, the other thing we want to draw in is the aggregate demand curve. And like you guessed, now there's some different reasons why it's downward sloping, but demand curves were downward sloping. We'll look at the reasons behind why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping, because it is different than a regular demand curve for a particular good or service. So we're going to draw that downward sloping, and I'm going to draw that right here on this one, such that the intersection there... That intersection of aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply is right there on the long run aggregate supply curve. Now, the economy is always going to be operating at the equilibrium where aggregate demand crosses the short run aggregate supply curve. That's going to be a short run equilibrium. Now, that's not where we're going to stay in the long run. We'll look at how the economy adjusts over time. We'll also look at some policies for stabilizing the economy if we have a GDP gap. But for now, we want to mark that point where short-run aggregate supply crosses aggregate demand, and that's going to give 